I made a conscious decision at one point in my life to study the sciences and I really graduated from arts in high school and went back and did sciences at a community college and worked very, very hard and got into a university in North Wales where a friend of mine was studying. And I kept wanting sort of more meat in my, in my work and when I finished my bachelor's I, I had an offer to go to Cambridge University to work with two of the top animal behavioralists in the world at that time, Bateson and Hind. And I went for this interview, they asked, well the first question they asked was, how far down in the animal kingdom do you think an animal can feel pain? And well, I thought, wow. I mean, I, I told them I really liked the question because it really required thought and it was philosophical as well as a neurological answer to it. I mean, what animals have nervous systems. Anyway, I applied to UBC to do a master's degree in biochemistry. That was the meat that I was talking about, getting more into the, into the biochemical realm. And I did a master's in biochemistry, and then I went to work at BC Cancer Research as a technician. My first job was to analyze vitamin A from human skin cells from inside the mouth that we were scraping out of people's mouths. And I worked there as a technician for a number of years, and then the fellow that I was working under that ran the department at Cancer Research, which was environmental carcinogenesis, suggested I do a doctorate degree. And up until that time, I had been trained all my courses in research and direction had been within the modern medical scientific realm. I was trained in Western science and um, they, I often say they made the mistake of sending me to India to do research there on oral cancer. Because in India I was exposed to people using Ayurvedic and herbal medicines which were thousands of, thousands of years old. And I saw old people walking around that looked fairly slim and in good shape and they weren't taking antidepressants or on heart medicines. And I started to look deeper into herbal medicines, moving away from my training in pharmaceutical type uh, medicines and structures. And then I came back to Canada after finishing the research in India and I ran into a herbalist here in Canada. My father-in-law was dying of cancer at that time and his family brought in a herbalist from the interior of BC and I, before I met this fellow, I said I'll have an open mind because I'd just come back from India where it had been opened. And this fellow got out these different herbal concoctions on the table and he told me to taste them. So I didn't take a little taste. And when I put it against my tongue, my whole mouth would light up. It was an amazing action to these herbal preparations that he'd made. That took me further into the herbal realm and I began doing research for this fellow. And in 1998, I started my own research company with a focus on herbal and uh, supplemental medicines. What brought myself into cannabis research? Can I show you a little ba sure. bag here? I, I'd love to do this. Let's turn this around. It's called hemp tea. <laughs> a little bag of innocuous looking tea from Grand Forks, BC. And this fellow in Grand Forks, who was a six foot six Duke of War with a long beard, and he would go out and into the field and so he'd harvest these young hemp seedlings, dry them, and put them into this bag, and he was selling at a cafe in, in Grand Forks, and little old ladies were coming up to him on the street and giving him a hug, thanking him for a good night's sleep. What he wanted myself to do was to use my HPLC to analyze the cannabinoids. Now, over the years, I've learned that cannabidiol is, in my mind, the most medicinal of all cannabinoids. But I love the profile of this little tea. It, and he had great effects with it, and he was trying to get it accepted by Health Canada, and there was no way they would let him ever license or sell it or do anything with it. Why do you think? <laughs> 
that opens up a huge can of worms, sir. There's, there's a, a, a multi-billion dollar industry out there that doesn't want these products on the market. Um, nevertheless, a, a major change occurred for myself when this fellow that brought the hemp tea from Grand Forks intro, introduced me to Hillary Black of the Compassion Club here in Vancouver, the original Compassion Club. She told of seven strains from Holland that, simply put, a person with chronic pain would take strain A over and over again, a person with seizure disorder would take strain B, a person with Crohn's disease would take strain C. All the time, knowing that there are thousands of strains of cannabis, each one has a different profile. It's like a fingerprint. And they have different efficacy, meaning it'll do what you say it'll do or have the desired effect in a specific illness. And Hillary spoke of these seven strains. I began analyzing them and then looking at the effects that it was having on the people, how a profile would affect a person. Then I had purchased some years earlier a farm in Richmond, uh, a, a small acreage farm, where we had a greenhouse and Hillary and myself and her favorite rower decided to grow some medicinal cannabis in our greenhouse. And we signed a contract with the club for the amount uh, that we would grow and how much we would receive for it. And the night that contract was signed, I went to heaven because now I had it. I had the seven strains being grown in my greenhouse. I could take them and analyze them at any time through the, through the growth cycle. I could talk to Hillary at the effects that she was seeing at the Compassion Club. And that heaven lasted for about six months, and then the RCMP came and called. And 10 of them arrived with guns pulled, and uh, we were all arrested, and it all went to hell. And it, it all broke up pretty sourly after that. And that was a traumatic time. And I learned a lot from that. I have never stopped analyzing cannabis because I only need a very small amount to do it. I need less than a gram. So I don't need cannabis on site. I just need small samples. I've had heated discussions with colleagues about why cannabis is illegal. In, in my mind, it disappeared around the same time as the pharmaceutical industries came into being, around the turn of the century. By 1930, it was pretty much illegal. The pharmaceutical industries have flourished in those years. When they discovered the receptor in the early 1990s, like I said, there's been an explosion of, of research around the endocannabinoid system. The last time I counted, the pharmaceutical industry has already synthesized 120 new drugs around this system. These will be used for weight loss, depression, various things. Synthetics are made in test tubes. Biological compounds are made by enzymes, plant enzymes most often. I have marveled. I continue, always marvel, at the complexity of the human system. Uh, we are just astoundingly complex. <laughs> Along comes this plant called cannabis, and I start studying it and looking at its efficacy. And in my simple mind, it, it is the most profoundly efficacious herb on the planet. Here's a, a good point, though. The receptor for THC was discovered in the early 1990s. I remember the day it happened. I remember hearing about it. There's actually a receptor there for it. As it turns out, that receptor is the most abundant G protein binding site in the human brain, but it's one of the most abundant receptors, too. It's all over the place. Most of these receptors are within the central nervous system. And when the receptor is bound, the overall effect is general slowdown in neurotransmission, hence pain relief, hence seizure relief. I look at cannabis as a CNS balancer, in the right dosage, of course, but it can be definitely used long-term, balancing the CNS, relieving pain, relieving seizures, and it's not going to hurt you. It's not going to kill you in time. It's not going to destroy your heart, liver, or kidneys from toxicity. 
Why do we have to convert cannabis? You ever wonder why you just don't take a bud off the plant and eat it? Because <laughs> nothing will happen. Well, a lot of things will happen, but you won't get the desired effect that you know from cannabis. The reason you have to heat up cannabis is to activate the THC. Um, in nature, THC has a little arm on it called a carboxyl group, which is really just CO2. A carbon, two oxygen atoms, and a hydrogen atom. And that hydrogen atom is just a proton. So when you heat it up, there's, there's this little arm sticking out. We'll say this is a THC molecule. It's got this carboxyl group on it. This is the weakest bond on the molecule. When a molecule is heated up, it begins to vibrate. And this one will break first. So with that on, it can't bind the receptor. With it off, it slaps into the receptor. You have to activate cannabis. Uh, you got to heat it in a brownie, burn it in a joint, but you have to heat it up to activate the THC, or it won't bind the receptor. Not only THC, but cannabin cannabinol, cannabidiol, cannabigerol, they all have acid groups on them in nature. Um, this is a decarboxylation curve here, again the bell curve, with temperature increasing this direction, and percent of THC that they're finding in, in, in their measurements after decarboxylation. This curve here is the THC acid curve. You see it's being decarboxylated, so it'll go away. It's all being converted to delta-9 tetrahydrocannabinol. And they get a maximum here, I believe it's at around 158 degrees centigrade. That's 311 degrees Fahrenheit, higher than most people would expect. Uh, but what will happen if you keep heating up in temperature, it'll start to evaporate. The THC now converted will start to go skyward. It'll evaporate. So you want to hit this optimum and then prevent evaporation. So I would heat for at least 300 degrees for 20, 30 minutes. We'll decarboxylate most samples. Now, if you've got a little bit of cannabis, say, wrapped in tinfoil, and you decarboxylate that, it's going to quit decarboxylate a lot quicker than one that's in a, in a cooker, for example, with just a, a whole bunch of cannabis in there, and the heat can't penetrate as well, and decarboxylation won't be as efficient. Here's the most common mistake, I believe, that people make in doing baked products, is that they will often take their raw material cannabis, whether it's shake or bud, or it's ground up, and they'll put it in with their uh, baking ingredients, mix it up, and stick it in the oven for a specific time and temperature. I, I would always do it the other way around. Convert your raw material first, decarboxylate it. You can grind it up before or after, and, and then put it into your baked product, and you don't want to cook at too high a temperature. But most cookies, you don't have to. You can, you can get away with lower temperatures. THC is extremely important active within cannabis. All herbal Medicines have what they consider actives in them, whether it's hypericin and St. John's wort or psilomerin and milk thistle. These are considered actives, and they're the medicinal ingredients within that herb. THC is an extremely important active within cannabis, uh, very important for pain relief, uh, appetite, seizure disorder, uh, Crohn's. There's a multitude of illnesses that cannabis affects, but the more I work and study the effects with individual people using cannabis therapeutically, and the more I study and the more information is realized about cannabis itself, cannabidiol is, uh, Fred Gardner, a California writer, called it the molecule of the year last year. And I said, Bravo, because Cannabidiol, as it's turning out in the research, is anti-inflammatory, it's anti-cancer, uh, anti it's antioxidant, it's anti-seizure. I know that I will be studying the cannabis plant for the rest of my life because there's so much to learn, and it's such a phenomenally useful plant. I've heard you can make more than 4,000 products from cannabis and only 2,000 from corn. Um, they make brake shoes from it in Germany, they make clothing from it, they make petroleum from it, they make food from it, they make medicine from it. To lose this plant 
I, I, I can't even imagine how, what a great loss that would be to us. Um, to study it, wow. To use it, to, to explore its medicinal value, oh. Because <laughs> I've spoken with many medical doctors over the years, and I've told a few of them, you know, if you were able to prescribe natural cannabis, you would be very, very happy because you would have people coming up and thanking you. That's, I'm, I, I keep going into the medicinal value of it, but it, it's a great food. It's a, you, know, it, it can, it can, you can run cars on it. Uh, but as a medicine, to lose it would be deplorable, absolutely unacceptable. Mm -hmm.